So good morning, um, it's afternoon now, uh, Dr. Paul Lee, welcome to the 40 News Podcast. Hello. How are you today? Yeah, I'm very well, thanks, apart from a few camera malfunctions, but uh, yeah, I'm doing fine, I've got my camera, my, I've got a nice cup of tea and all ready to go. Fantastic, I've just got a new mug, which is, uh, I don't know if you see, it's a nice ghost, ghost oh, mug. Oh yeah, so. that's very good. Yeah. Mine's got Winnie the Pooh on it, which uh, is <laughs> comparable. <laughs> a little bit different. Um, yeah. <laughs> So you're just about to release your second book. It's, um, out, now. it's out now, is it? Excellent. It's, it's out now, yes. Fantastic. So we've we've got two books and an app. Um, but before we get into those, I'm really interested always in the person kind of behind um, the the paranormal and how they go down the path of exploring it, either even as someone that researches it or debunks it, of what those experiences and led to that. So... I think first of all, it's to say is you were born on Halloween. Is that right? That's right. Yes. In 1971. Yes. And that was in Nigeria. That was. Yeah. But my dad was on work placement over there in Lagos. He's there from 66 to 72. And then the company recalled him. Um, they only allowed two terms of three years out there for health reasons because of the climate. Right. So in 72, he was recalled and uh, we moved back. Um eventually settling in Darlington and the northeast yep. where he still lives and uh, I've been moving around the country ever since yeah fantastic so you you weren't in Nigeria much in as you in your childhood I was there for seven months seven so months I nothing of it right are you allowed so a Nigerian I've, I've, passport I uh, I don't know but I can get one mm. Which, uh, might help with accessing certain countries, but uh, yeah, there's no problem. So I've got I've got my Nigerian birth certificate, yeah. so I could always contact the consulate and ask for a uh, a passport, no problem. Yeah, yeah, that's always. I'm I'm half Dutch, so I'm I'm exploring the possibility of getting a Dutch passport. But and and then you've um you you're a scientist, aren't you? So how how did you kind of get involved in down that road? Uh, well, I've always been interested in science um, from my early days. Um, had an interest in science fiction, uh, Doctor Who and Star Trek and whatever. So it just seemed like a, a logical progression to go into that uh, career path. So I uh, focused on science subjects at GCSE and then A-levels. And then I started at Southampton University. I did an engineering course, first of all, which didn't go down very well. Um so I switched to um, physics after one semester, and these tut the, the tutors were very, very supportive of me. They gave me all of their lecture notes that I'd missed, and I talked to um, staff, and they asked other um, students if they can keep an eye out for me and make friends with me and whatever. But one uh, <laughs> one tutor said he's never heard of anyone who's missed a whole semester and passed the first year. And I thought, well, right, I'll prove you wrong. And um, I did. I got a, I got a first. Well I worked done. hard for it. So uh, despite missing the first 12 weeks and having to cap, work really hard to catch up and doing lots and lots of extra revision for the exams in subjects that I hadn't attended as lectures, um, yeah, I, I got a first-class degree. And then I went on to do nuclear physics at York University, uh, which was fraught with some personal problems, but um, I succeeded there. And then I moved into the uh, computing industry, although I'm I'm semi-retired at the moment. I'm, I research and write books, so I, my scientific skills have been in, have been lapsed recently. But I'm still trying to keep my technical mind going. Yeah, I bet, and and you must have quite a technical mind as well to to get a doctorate in nuclear physics. That's quite something. That was quite tricky, actually. A lot of it is very very difficult to understand and mm. a part of my thesis was based on the principle that I had my results but the theory hadn't quite caught up with it yet so I just thought well I can't really wait years for the theoreticians to explain what we're seeing so I just published what I had compared it to other results and uh, submitted it and uh, I, I passed which I was a little bit surprised by that's but, uh, very impressive very impressive it, well, I remember that day very well. I was so convinced that I was going to fail that um, I ended up, um, I, I just burst into tears. I was oh. just so emotional. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, and uh, then I, uh, a couple of weeks later, I moved into the uh, computing in the computing field, doing some defense work. And it wasn't quite my cup of tea, but I stayed with them and then BA for a few more years. 
uh, did some little jobs after that and uh, then I just gave up for health reasons and started writing books and doing technical stuff websites and whatever and here I am now that's fantastic yeah quite quite a journey and um so your books are on the haunted hospitality volume that's one right, and yeah. volume two out now um how, how did you get into the paranormal especially as a scientist and someone with a, a very scientific brain um i haven't the faintest idea it must have started at a very early age um my parents were complete non-believers but they didn't uh, dissuade my my interest in the field. Um, I had a lot of friends who supposedly were interested in the paranormal, but looking back, I think they were just um, uh, taking the mickey, shall we say. And uh, I was a bit gullible in those days, but I was always getting ghost books or borrowing ghost books and trying to watch horror films late at night. Um, and I don't know where my interest came from, I say it might be because I was born on Halloween, but my parents didn't believe, but they didn't say it's all rubbish. You must not borrow this. And they always got me ghost, monster, UFO, et cetera, yeah. uh, books for Halloween and Christmas uh, for my birthday and on uh, Christmas Day. Um, but they just weren't interested in it themselves. So that was good of them to, to um, they could have easily said that it's rubbish. You're not to follow this chain of thought. Yeah, They didn't do that at all. That's really my yeah. interest is uh, just um, it is it's been through ebbs and flows ever since then. There was a couple of years when I went through a period of non interest, as most people do, and it comes uh, wallowing back, and it's done that ever since. That's amazing. I, I love that. It's um, your own kind of like private little little hobby uh, of, of exploration. Did you do you have any, any experiences yourself? Um, nothing that I could say was definitely paranormal. Um, I, I put down a lot of it due to psychology, like you're being primed to believing something. One of the first ghost hunts I went on uh, was at Dudley Castle. That was about 1994, I think. And uh, we were stopping a... Um, it was a lodge in the grounds of the castle near the zoo, which was occupied previously by a children's entertainer. And uh, he'd had a couple of weird experiences... And we managed to get access to it. It was called the Roundhouse, and it's just um, off the car park near the zoo. And I was absolutely convinced during our vigil that something was going to come down the stairs, which were only a few feet to my right. And I kept looking in that direction. And the atmosphere was building up and up and up, like a crescendo. And, event, and for some reason, the atmosphere, after, after about half an hour of that, the atmosphere just completely evaporated. It became mm. so light that I ended up falling asleep. And I've only ever had that happen once before in another haunted location, but nowhere to that same extent. It just felt like something was going to happen. And I don't know whether that was due to the psychology of it. We were in a mm. very enclosed environment. I'd heard the stories, which was probably a mistake because that um, primed me to, to expect something to happen. But it the atmosphere just went after a while, and I couldn't believe it. Mm. And the other time that happened was to a lesser extent, and it was in a recording studio where again some odd things had happened. And again, the atmosphere was going up and up. It's like an electric field building mm. up a storm approach, and then pop, it just went. Yeah, yeah, I've, de I've definitely experienced that on on yeah, investigations. It, it's odd. It's, it's almost terrifying, but then it just goes. Yeah. I've had a couple of other experiences, but not not quite as memorable as those. In in fact, I um I completely forgot about them until I was reading my notes many years later. So I thought, well, they kind of left that much of an impression on me if I didn't remember them at the time. But that happened on two vigils, uh, just a short period apart, um, and it was of a very tall black shape that loomed up right in front of me and blocked out the light behind. And in the blink of an eye, it was gone. Wow. Um, and that happened in two different locations. And I don't know what it was. And I was, I'm tempted to put that down to just a trick of the mind. You know, you sat in a almost completely dark room. The yeah. expectation is there. But then I was speaking to someone recently who'd attended a ghost hunt at one of those venues and I explained what had happened. And he said, you're not the only one to have that exact same phenomena occurring in that same location so That's that makes me think that it wasn't purely psychological 
but I don't know what it was. But I, looking back, I remember it very well now. A uh, huge black shape uh, right in front of me, taller than me, and it blocked out all the lights behind. But then it was just gone. It was there for a second or two. Yeah, shadow person. It could yeah. have been, yeah. There's been quite a lot of those uh, reports. On, when I did my survey a couple of years back. I didn't get, I didn't get a lot of responses. The ones who did respond to my questionnaire, hardly any of them with positive replies talked about recognisable human, human or animal forms. But the majority who had experienced shapes always talked about um, black shadows seen out of the corner of the eye. Mm. And that was a consistent theme amongst all of these responses I was getting, um, which I thought was quite striking. I thought, why are, why are ghosts suddenly lacking definition? Are these perhaps running out of energy and this is their last gasp? They're just fading away. But there was enough of these responses for me to think that that's a possibility that um, the ghosts are going from recognisable through to darkness and then eventually they'll just disappear completely. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there has definitely been, um, you know, from the th research that I do, a, a, an increase in, in these kind of shadow people phenomena. Yeah. I think from, from what my point of view is, is, is it people consciously listening and then the whatever these things are responding to that form because more people, it's in the kind of the modern vernacular that if it's discussed on the internet in podcasts, then more people have that expectation and then see what they're expecting in a way. That's right, yes. I'm always a bit sceptical about the use of the term shadow people because that implies mm. a population of these mm. things where I think a lot of these are just like one-offs, like one or two figures seen at a certain location. It'd be nice to know that if there is a certain um, populace of these spectres floating around. Um, and also I think the term shadow people has become like a bit of a cliche these mm. days. Yeah, I just call them ghosts, apparitions, spooks, whatever, because that's what yeah. I'm familiar with. Yeah, no, definitely. And um, how how did th those kind of experiences change you then from from being interested to potentially having some experiences yourself? Um, they didn't really inspire me or change my opinion of them. Um, I became a lot more skeptical about the methods of psychics during these. Mm. Um, because I noticed that a, a lot of the psychics that I'd met um, seemed to be the kind of people who wanted to be the centre of attention mm. and everyone huddled around them wanting the latest snippet of information. Um, so I just became a bit disheartened by that. There was always um, an impetus for people to just accept what was being said by the psychics, but not to investigate or research it any further. So my mindset about ghosts hasn't changed a great deal, but the methodology involved has, and it's because of, the, and also people are using gadgets and they don't know how they work, so they're getting a lot of false positives, which they ascribe to ghosts. These yeah. things make me sceptical about the results that people are claiming, mm -hmm. but not about the phenomena itself. Yeah. I, I always say to people, um, as particularly as an ex-scientist, if it was all a load of old rubbish, I wouldn't waste my time on it. Mm. And I sincerely mean that. There is something there that is worth investigating. But then I always get asked, do you believe in ghosts? And I I just have to shrug my shoulders and I say, well, I've encountered things which might be psychological. I don't know. But then I say, I give the usual cop-out answer, which is a lot of people have experience phenomena which they can't explain mm. and some of them might be paranormal but i just don't know and i think that it is um arrogant and quite rude to dismiss the, all their observations as hoaxes or delusions they've, they've encountered something which in some cases have changed their lives completely and i think not only should we be sympathetic but we should investigate further now it, it could be that um, what they've encountered might be an hallucination. It might be a, a mental lapse or something, or it might be something genuinely paranormal. We just we just don't know. Mm. But for the sceptics to come forward and just say, oh, it's due to some fancy effect, yeah. is, um, well, it, to put it mildly, it's, it's a little bit rude. Yeah. And I, while I've got respect for psychologists like Chris French, 
um, who is interested in the field and he's very sympathetic and has an, has an interest. He's not militant. He's got an interest in the field. I think you might be able to say to people that that grey lady seen standing at the end of your bed at three o'clock in the morning might be hallucination caused by you've just by the fact you've just woken up and i think that's yes that's a possibility but psychology can't explain when things fly off shelves or levitate mm. because yeah. that's not an internal uh, manifestation within the human brain that is a physical manifestation within the environment which psychology can't explain so yes psychology can explain some of it but and science is fumbling for answers but I think to just say to people, you're bonkers, is is rude. We should yeah. accept what people say. And if it turns out later on that it's not real or it is real, then we should uh, we should accept that. I say Absolutely. science is not fumbling for answers. Which I, I think a, a lot of what we've seen can be, ex particularly poltergeist cases, can be explained by, uh, if, if you think of poltergeist as being like, um, invisible naughty children that explains yeah. a lot of what we see yeah, but then yeah. the problem then is explain invisibility and we can't yeah and um, so science has a lot of catching up and there's a lot of dismissive attitude out there which i and i don't think we're going to get much progress in the next few years because there's so much hostility in the scientific world about against ghosts it's mm. a great pity when i was at york university i was involved with two ghost groups the first was an undergraduate group which um was mainly in it for fun we did ouija boards all the time nothing odd happened we had and then we went off to the union bar and had a many drinks and the other one was a postgraduate group which was more scientifically based and tried to get some results and certain members of the university faculty um didn't seem to be very keen on us um being affiliated with them um right. we thought that if we can get a member of staff with a phd to their name to be a, a sponsor or or just use that to give it a bit of um scientific veritas then that would give up the group more credibility and the only person we could find was a, a visiting um professor who was only an occasion and we couldn't get in touch with him so we asked um we asked up the postdoc in our group if he would like to be a member of the uh, member, so we could say Doctor, whatever his name was, um, is an accredited member, and he he jokingly laughed and said, "If you put my name on your forms, I will sue you." Now he's only joking, but I think yeah, I think everyone else would say the same thing, but they wouldn't be joking. They just do not want to get involved because it's career suicide to them. Mm, that's it. I've, I've I've spoke to some people who who are have tried researching it and no no one will provide the funding um because of that but i suppose it's challenging the fabric of reality of everything that we believe scientifically whatever these are these like you said it's this trickster element that causes mischief with reality and and transforms it in front of our eyes so it's bending the rules of everything we believe in and that's then i suppose in one way is challenging the foundation of science itself it is, yes. So, and the easiest way to get around that is to say that it's all a load of all rubbish. That is mm -hmm. the easy way to explain all these things. But again, that's rude and it's dismissive and it's arrogant and it's just not the right way to do it. But then we get challenged by the scientists, which is, uh, explain it then. If you, yeah. if these people have seen the bar glasses levitating off counters or seen doors open and closing by themselves without explanation, well, you explain it and we can't. Yeah. So then they say, ah, well, maybe it's all a load of all rubbish then, the usual standard standard approach. But science cannot explain most of these things. Um, and I don't think there's much interest in yeah. the academic world to uh, research, the, research the spontaneous cases within a scientific framework. All we left are the amateurs. And as I said, some of their results are... Some of their results leave a lot to be uh, desired, like... Yeah particularly in the newspapers when you see pictures of orbs or whatever, and they've been debunked so many times. Yeah. I just think it must be a, a quiet news day in the media. Um, But these these ghost groups are of the opinion that um, they're an expert in optics and their camera equipment functions absolutely perfectly and flawlessly all the time. Therefore, it must be ghosts. 
Yeah. And I think that is a load of old hogwash. Yeah. These people aren't ex experts in optics any more than Joe blogs down the street. If you were to take um, your images to an, a recognised expert, they might demolish it. And yet we see these pictures all the time of misty shapes on battlements saying it's proof of a ghost. I think, well, it could be pareidolia for all we know. Mm. Or it could be camera malfunction, despite what the witnesses say. The camera might have had a malfunction. We just don't know. Yeah, definitely. I, I get a bit sceptical about these ghost groups. Some of them have produced some fantastic evidence, mm. but a lot of them are just like, as I, as I said in the 14 times last year, I call them most haunted wannabes. Yeah. But they're the ones who seek, um, <laughs> uh, crave fame and fortune. The, the, a lot of the most credible results we get are from the smaller groups who don't crave the, uh, uh, the respectability of their peers they just go out they do their thing often with a minimum of equipment they just use their five basic senses a pen and a notepad and they come back with interesting things and they're the ones who actually do try and debunk things if they hear mm. a noise they will try and identify where it came from and what it could possibly be but so many groups these days they just think we've heard a strange noise it must be a ghost and accept it yeah, hear footsteps on the stairs. Um, a fantastic case that was told to me a few years back uh, was of a lady who was hearing recurrent footsteps on her stairs every night at about the same time. And they couldn't explain what it was. It did sound like footsteps got marching up the stairs. And one um, enterprising <laughs> member of this group he and his friends actually took the staircase to bits, floorboard by floorboard. And they found that what was happening was that at a certain time in the morning, the, the house cooled down, the timber settled, and the the um, stairs hadn't been um, set correctly when originally built. So when one um, stair settled, it would knock the next stair out of alignment, and then that would knock the next stair out of alignment and so on and so on. And it would do this sequentially, one at a time, until it sounded like something was marching up the stairs. And when the staircase was rebuilt properly, the, this, these ghostly footsteps never, ever occurred again. Amazing. Now, that is, <laughs> that's a more extreme method of ghost hunting, a more extreme method of debunking. But it works. You yeah. just need to get the permission from the household to take things to bits. Yeah. That's, most ghost groups would hear that and say it was a ghost. Yeah, yeah. You need someone with dedication to actually say, no, it's probably the stairs and take the floorboards to bits. Yeah. I've never gone that far. I, I do investigations and I, I do, I frustrate people because I I do um, debunk most things. But then I feel like if if then I'm challenged, then what's what's left is the things that we haven't been able to debunk. Then that opens up the, the evidence to be a bit more kind of evidence-based. But also I, I genuinely believe that most most of the time, when we're trying to gather evidence, I, I I talk about the poltergeist being a personal experience often, um, and and the moment that you've got your camera set up, nothing happens, and when you've taken your cameras down, that's when everything kicks off. Yeah. Um, and and I think that is actually from from me personally, I think that's part of it. But I, I there's one story I always tell which demonstrates what you you said there of um, a house about about. Five miles from here, who had yeah. um, two different um, investigation teams go in, and um, and one of them terrified the family because they said that this this banging on the walls it was demonic and um, and all this, and you know they were thinking of even moving out and not staying nights. They were staying in a um, a caravan just to not to be in. And we went in um, myself and one other person, and, and we were like, "What time did you?" heating come on and they were putting the heating on in the night just as a quick blast and half an hour after that the the pipes were banging on the walls and it was as simple as that oh god and um but yeah no, i always say like anyone could be a paranormal investigator and yet we let these people in our homes and and we just need to be a bit more more careful really yes you have to be careful in more ways than one because you might put the fear of god into these people yeah. 
yeah. they might be so terrified by a, a proclamation that there's there's a demon in the house yeah. Yeah. and you don't know how they'll react they yeah. might just shrug their shoulders and laugh or they could be absolutely terrified out there yeah. yeah you have to be very careful how you tell these people um and particularly if they're vulnerable and i was saying this to someone very very recently um these some people might be seeing ghosts because they're psychologically stressed yeah they might have mental health problems so the ghost might be real to them but it could just be in their mind yeah so you have to treat these people with a great deal of care and concern and recognize the fact that they might have some health problems uh, forget about the ghosts a focus on the person primarily they might need help yeah and you've got to be able to recognize those signs um and absolutely we we did one last year and and there was some activity going on but it's like you said this this person also had mental health issues and our recommendation was to Im go to the doctors go outside exercise you know improve your mental health and then the phenomena will decrease as, as a result of that anyway yeah. um and and some of them sometimes it is just mental health and sometimes it's both and sometimes the paranormal activity seems to feed the mental health um yeah. because it's you're in this state of hyper awareness in your own house that's right you're meant yeah. to relax so well, it's I... sorry carry on no i was just going to say so it's it's it's, it's 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 been very ethical and and we refuse to film and, and release that that evidence as well because we we think it's quite exploitative in our team that's right yes well, certainly the, the police have got a, a similar attitude. Uh, I, I wrote a, a book on local ghosts around here, and um, I went through a couple of processes of applying for information on ghostly reports by the Freedom of Information, and the first result was useless, so I pressed them, and they gave me a spreadsheet which listed the uh, reports that they'd had and the outcome now it didn't give many details like addresses it just gave vague locations um so i, I don't know i don't know where a lot of these places were but the spreadsheet said what basically what was reported and what the outcome was and the outcome in a lot of those instances were um the person had mental health problems they need to see the doctor and that was it case closed mm. only a few things in the spreadsheet had hints that there might be something there worthy of investigation but the, the police have basically put it down to intruders malfunctions uh mental health problems all that kind of stuff um in, interesting to read but not quite what you're after I, I don't think the police were in the mood to concede that there might be things beyond their realm of experience which i i can sympathize with because they'd be laughed at if they were to say mm. yes there was a ghost unless they actually saw it with their own eyes yeah they, they did actually talk about a couple of uh saturday night um thrill seekers who tried to break into an RAF base and when they were confronted they said they were there for the ghosts and the police told them to <clears throat> off and yeah, that was yeah. case closed yeah so there were a couple a few gems of interesting interesting anecdotes amongst these dozens and dozens of uh, spreadsheet entries saying mental health no further action etc etc interesting but not quite what you're after as a researcher yeah have you have you read the credible witness books I haven't no actually. I think I've heard of them, but I don't know much about them. There, um, that was a police officer who asked his colleagues to submit things anonymously, um, and and then he he put those books out. They're they're really good. Definitely worth checking out of some I'll some police experiences. I'll definitely try them. Yes, it'd really be good. interesting to hear what the police do say. Um, I, I've come across a few instances of stories where the police have. Uh, encountered things and they've either asked for anonymity or they've they said stuff it to use my name and um, one was in a town quite close to here called Didlington and this was back in the 50s when the police used to do their beats on the bicycle and he was cycling from village to village late on a Saturday night and he heard the chimes of a distant church um, ringing out and at first he thought nothing of it. Then he realised that um, the church bell hadn't rung for years. 
So he was thinking of an intruder and he got to the uh, the front gate and by this time the bell had rung 14 times. So he walked up the path and as he got to the main, the, the, the front uh, door of the church, the, the chiming stopped. Now he knew that there was a key underneath the uh, the mat, so he fished it out and he went into the church and he looked around and there was absolutely no one in there except there was one thing out of place and that is the rope to the belfry where the bell was was still swinging wildly but there was no one there uh, at which point he was so frightened he just locked up the church cycled home and he said all the way home he gave up he gave up the rest of his beat he just went straight home and he said on his way home he felt as if there was something behind him pulling him back and his wife remarked just how terrified he looked mm. and um the next day he said to um, someone, uh, he explained the situation, and they got talking about Didlington Hall nearby, which was demolished a few years previously. And he just asked out of curiosity, said, what date was it? What date did the last owner die? And he said, no, it's a September the 4th, 1951. And this, gen this uh, policeman, PC Hawes, had his experience on the 4th of September, 1956. And the synchronicity of the date stayed with him. And um, there's one of the few policemen who would go on record and give his name. At first he was anonymous, but a couple of years later he gave an interview to the paper and they published his full name. He was he retired by then. And the newspaper persuaded him to go back to the church to do a, a recreation of that night's events. And when they got to Diddlington Church, they looked through the window and they found a load of Cambridge University students practicing black magic. <laughs> <laughs> but I say the policemen very rarely like to give their name. This yeah. is what I did, probably because he was retired and thought, stuff it, they can't take my pension away from me. A lot of times it's just, um, I, I tell you, but I don't use my name. They just fear yeah. ridicule, I think. It, yeah. It's like um, RAF, it's like army personnel, RAF and Navy. They don't like to be quoted by name. Yeah, yeah. We we get referrals sometimes when from the police um, when there is something going on, and but officially we don't ever. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but no, we we actually had a policeman on an investigation once in in Filey. Um, that was an interesting night, and we, we, it was useful just having that witness to kind of be able to debunk stuff and you know really have that kind of way of way of thinking in terms of analyzing yeah. is really really useful actually um i was yeah what what we do as well just thinking about the psychics is, is we do an investigation normally when we get a chance if more of an open thing and then we we do our investigation um on our own and then we get the psychic in separately um and see if anything matches up without them knowing what what we've done and 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 normally telling um keeping them blind as well as to where we're going yes so that, that's, that's a very good methodology that yes yeah not many places do um and it gives them a chance to do prior research not only yeah. into the, the history but also the ghosts there and people are just amazed when they come with all this corroborative information but they could have got it from anywhere yeah. and I, I see psychics in two ways i say either they're going to tell you something which is already known or they're going to tell you something which can't be confirmed. And I think, well, look at it that way. Why use them? Yeah. What are they going to tell it? I can't remember the last time a psychic said something which was later found in newly unearthed records. It might have happened, but I just can't think of one. We've got um, close here, we've got um, Castle Rising, which is very famous. And it's supposedly haunted by the ghosts of uh, Queen Isabella. And it's said allegedly that um sorry my computer's playing up um it's said that at night her screaming wraith can be he heard in the castle walls and that is just accepted and it's repeated by ghost hunters and psychics but i i, I contacted alison weir who wrote a biography of um, isabella the, the so-called she wolf of france and She's interested in the paranormal and she was fascinated by my research and her book had a bit of a diatribe about these ghost reports. And she's found a lot of evidence which says that Queen Isabella did not um, 
suffer any lapses in her mental health in the later stages of her life. She was compass mentors. Mm. She was quite focused, quite mentally aware. So there was there's absolutely no reason for her to be this screaming, shrieking phantom that pervades the halls of Castle Rising. And yet the story's repeated time and time again. But it's easy to find that amongst ghost hunting reports. It's and it's and for that reason it's it's just repeated verbatim on mm. websites and whatever. But if you go back and look at the original documentation that like Alison Weir did, and she's horrified at um Isabella's ghostly reputation, a post-mortem reputation. If you do what she did, there's no proof that Isabella is this screaming phantom. And yet it's repeated all the time. It is so frustrating. So when I look at these stories that I hear about all the time, I think, can this possibly be debunked? I don't think, is it real? I don't doubt what people have experienced. I just doubt the interpretation. So I always think, can it be debunked? Is the historical record that can demolish these claims mm. and leave just and leave us with just the basic outline, the ghost stories? Yeah. Another great one near here is um, RAF Birch and Newton, which is now the Construction Industry Training Board. In uh, nineteen seventy, in late nineteen seventy one, uh, a pair of psychics visited it, and they then they said that they were in touch with three ghosts in the haunted squash court there and we were given a rough date of the ghost death their names and a couple of other biographical information it was repeated for many many years and it's now been proven beyond doubt that every single bit of information the ghost has given is is hog is, is cod's wallop it's a load of old rubbish and we don't know whether the ghosts were having a joke with us or the psychics were and yeah. psychics are now both dead so we just will never know yeah so it's a case of can this be debunked are there records which can explain it or not and in this case birch and newton it's been proven although it's still repeated that what the ghost the alleged ghost said in 71 is absolute rubbish yeah and we, we get still a fascinating case we get these these cases as well where they you know they give you a load of information and it's some of it's accurate, and then there's always something that's ridiculous as well that that doesn't marry up to. They might say to you know, I'm thinking of um, the Battersea Poltergeist, where the information they were getting was this runaway prince from France, and then there was yes. certain stuff that actually did match history, and then other things that were absolutely ridiculous. Yes, it's and, it's hard to know what to make of it in that case. Do you throw up the whole case because certain bits of information are fallacious? Mm. Or do you just focus on the bits that can be verified and just relegate the dubious um, aspects to a footnote in your book? Yeah. It's difficult yeah. to know what to do. It's, I think it's probably a little bit of a mistake to throw out the whole thing just because a few little details mm. are awry. In the case of Bertram Newton, everything was complete rubbish. So you had to just say, yeah, goodbye, ghosts. Yeah, but yeah. I, I, I know of the the, um, the Battersea Poldergeist case. I haven't read the book, but I have listened to um, the fantastic re uh, recreation on the radio. Mm. And I honestly do not know what to make of it. Um, but what you said about little, um, little aspects of it, not making sense mm. it, it's like when people go to um see a psychic on the stage um if if 99 things that the psychic says are wrong that will be forgotten it's the one out of 100 that will be remembered yeah and people focus on that but not all the misses and in the battersea poltergeist case i think that a lot of people have done the same thing yeah. they've focused on the aspects which do make sense and the ones which don't are conveniently forgotten, yeah. which is not the way research is done. You can't, you really shouldn't cherry pick data. It's just absolutely unacceptable. You can try and explain it or explain it away if you want, but you must never ignore it. Because mm. that not only, not only does that give yourself a bad reputation, you give the whole field a bad reputation. Because people yeah. just don't know if they can trust you anymore if you're going to miss out. Um inconvenient little bit snippets of data which uh turn out to be rubbish yeah. 
that, that's me with my scientist hat on. And yeah. many times in my field where I've encountered data which I couldn't explain. So I just had to not explain the way, but I had to I had to give some evidence as to why it's either not credible or that future research might help. Yeah. Because that is the honest thing to do. That's all that's all you can do. Yeah. If that but... makes sense. No, definitely. I mean, my my personal belief, and I get a lot of flack in the the paranormal field for this. In fact, I got some hate mail this week for it. Um, is I I believe the poltergeist is is very different to to ghosts, and they they're never who they say they are. I don't think yes. my belief is they're a separate consciousness that lives outside the body that can manipulate um, matter, and yes. they they purposely and and then also what what you were saying before about people believe in it's this that and the other they'll start then giving you that information and presenting themselves as as something they seem to be able to access knowledge whatever it is yeah and um it, it could be anything you know if you look at even the the mongoose who was oh, then God, yes asked for evidence <laughs> and and the evidence was evidence of something but not of anything because all three footprints for example it gave were of a different animal and yes. none of them on the isle of man either so it's these really strange, the trickster element, what used to be, you know, we, we talk about it being ghosts now, but it used to be ascribed to the Fae, didn't it? And Yeah, that's right, yes. The trickster god, coyote god in Native Americans and all these other cultural aspects, but with the same presentation of activity. Yeah. But even when um, ghosts via mediums or writing paper or whatever or the communication methods even when they do give information a lot of it just doesn't make sense as yeah. you say it's almost as if they're having a joke with us or they're deliberately lying to us they might throw out a few little gold mines of verifiable information but a lot of the time it's just absolute junk they come out with and that takes a lot of time to research yeah and i'm i'm becoming more and more convinced that there are ghosts or entities that float around the ether and they latch onto people or places and it's almost as if when you talk to them they're giving a a, a false inf a false information just for just for a jape just for a joke yeah. and well i i keep talking about uh, norfolk where i come from and there's a great example in the state where i live until 1968 where I lived was just farmland and fields. And then there was the London overspill scheme and they turned the whole area into a, a massive sprawling estate. And yet time and again, we are getting ghost stories from little areas in this estate. And they seem to be going back quite a long way when there was absolutely nothing here before. Mm. People are saying, well, Roman settlements and or medieval and you look at the maps there's there was never anything here um and uh, there's a great one just up the road there's a charity shop and next door to it is a convenience shop and they both have um pa uh, poltergeist and ghostly activity happening to this day they're they're ongoing ghostly phenomena and until 68 there was absolutely nothing there at all but these ghostly reports would seem to indicate it's almost as if there was a building there and that's where these ghosts have come from. But we know that there wasn't a building there. Mm. Something of where the hell have these ghosts come from? Mm. And I'm seeing that in quite a few places. It It is almost as if these things are just floating around and looking for someone to latch onto. Yeah. And we've got quite a few of those in this, in this town. Yeah. And I can't think of any other reason because if ghosts are associated with locations or or sometimes people like Polder, some poltergeist cases are said to be, then what happens if there's nothing there in the first place? There was no building where these to which these ghosts could have come. Yeah. There's nothing there. And yeah. we've, we've got a um, a hospital just up the road. And when it was first opened, that the very first unit had the sounds of a ghostly clock chiming and ticking, and they could not find it at all. It's had they've had other phenomena since then, but this was the first unit built. And the source of this was a guy who was there from the very beginning, and he told me about the clock story. He said the story is that the, the hospital was built on the site of an old mansion, and the clock is the spectral remnant of this this old clock or this old house. So I thought, okay, that's something that can be checked. 
So I went and looked at some old maps and there was a field there and there was um, an orchard and there were no houses anywhere in this side of the town. So where the hell is this ghostly clock coming from? And is the I belief that a, is the belief a, in the story then what creates consciously the whatever they are then creates that from everyone's conscious belief into the present? It could be. It's it's impossible to tell. It was certainly real for the people who uh, experienced it. Mm. Um, that that unit was um, was actually a psychiatric unit. Right. When my friend told me, he said, I should point out that it wasn't just the patients, it was the staff who was here. <laughs> so yeah. um, so it, it was certainly real to them. And the hospital, as I say, there was nothing there beforehand. But we're getting all these fantastic stories um, from 1980-ish up to the present day and there's no explanation for them and not even you could say well people die in hospitals and they've come back to haunt their last place yes maybe but that doesn't ring true in all cases and mm. um, there's been little poltergeist things like and i've he's a he's, he's, he's a great little example and it's actually um from the um uh, an office there's no visible apparitions at all um, they deal with a lot of medical records and for that, for confidentiality, every time they leave the office, even for just two seconds, they have to lock the door. They can't have the door open and unattended at any other time. Well, this person was um, having major problems with IT and in frustration, she threw her fluorescent marker pen on the floor in anger. And she left the office and went for a walk around the block. She locked the door behind her. So she went for a cool off, a relax, and she came back and the marker pen was now on her desk. And she asked and no one else had been in there. And she was sure that she didn't replace it. And she's also said she's had, had things like lights turning on and off um, or her, the water bottle on her desk being moved when she goes out. Now, maybe someone was playing a trick with her, but this, these are just mundane little things. But the one with the marker pen really struck her. Mm. She was sure that there was no one. She was working on her own in the office that day. And I say, well, she went out, she locked the door, went for a walk, came back, and the pen was on the desk. And, that's, and also she'd found things like water bottles moving and whatever. And no one else had been in there. Uh, and then you do get the apparitions of the hospital and voices mm. which have frightened people so much that they had to call in a, a priest to exercise a corridor. Uh, did one did that work? Was, I'm not sure. I think the lady, the, the lady who told me, I think she left or she went to a new uh, department not so long afterwards. I think it might have worked. Um, but she, one thing that really frightened her was she was walking down a corridor, she had to get up to the next floor. And it was quicker to go up the steps than take the lift. And um, she was walking along with the uh, wall to her her right side, I think it was. And she heard a voice right in her ear saying, now get out. Wow. And that was right where the wall was. Well, as you can imagine, she broke the sound barrier running up the stairs. <laughs> um, the the um, cleaning staff were mainly Filipinos, took to wearing crucifixes and lucky charms to ward off this evil ghost and eventually they did call in this priest and they tried to uh they tried to treat the whole story as, as a bit of levity because they didn't want it to frighten them or get in the mm. way of their hospital duties and they ended up called nicknaming the ghost evil edna so every time anything bad happened they just oh it's evil edna and they had a bit of a chuckle and it, it didn't really bother them that much weird things at that place like sounds of uh, crying children that can't be found poltergeist stuff mm. really bonkers yeah yeah my friend uh tim works well worked in a, a mental hospital um in gloucestershire and he's um people I, I interviewed tim in a video once and then people who saw it thought i was i was really short and i'm just under six foot three but he's a big big guy yes um, but he makes me look tiny and um he 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 was thrown, and he was kind. Of, he was really skeptical as well. But he was thrown off his feet um, oh, across God. the room, um, and actually dislocated his knee. And he said, uh, "He said, if you saw it, you would have seen me like thrown. It wasn't a fall. There was yeah. a force like threw me across the room." Um, and and they've they've had loads of experiences at, the, at that hospital. So definitely, I think uh, again, if you look at 
you know mental health and that opens up reality and um I, th- I think why theaters I always talk about are always haunted and yet they're not really a place of death but I believe this opening up your mind to the disbelief of you you're going into a separate kind of consciousness looking at a play because you believe yes. in something that you know isn't real is real in order to follow the story and that's your own suspension of belief and then does that kind of welcome in whatever these other entities are that then use that or go within that and and work with our consciousness i think it's a a relationship yeah. it could be what like opening a door to them opening up mm. a barrier it it could be we just know so little about this uh, mm. this whole field and you can't um, prove anything either which no that's that's a frustrating part and, and when you are presented with evidence uh, video or audio it's usually very very dubious mm. um, yeah. evps i just a lot of them i just laugh at because they yeah. are so unclear it's it's unbelievable and you, it's usually when you're being told what you're expected to hear that you yeah. can agree with people most time it's just noise and there are a couple of youtube videos of people with audio software and they're just randomly clicking on buttons and dials and slider controls until they get something which is vaguely recognizable I don't think do these people have any kind of qualifications in um, acoustics at all. And I reckon they don't. They're just filling around with potluck. Mm. So even when evidence is presented, um, it's just, it most of it's just laughable, really. I'm yeah. just not convinced at all. Yeah. But yeah. We, we often side, have a giggle. On the other side, it, it's been said that even if you were to get crystal clear evidence of a ghost, you'd, you'd still be told it's too good to be true. So you can't yeah. win either way. That's that's what I was just situation from the beginning. I was just about to say that we, um, yeah, most EVPs, we, it could be anything. The Estes method's good, but um, but we we got one really clear, and um, and we we were we were walking along the corridor, and we said, right, we're going to go into to that room now, and as clear as day on the tape, it went, and what thou asked, like really clear, wow. as, if, <laughs> as if one of us said it. But the problem is, to anyone listening we can't prove that one of us didn't say it even though it was so it's very experiential for the people there as evidence but for anyone else they'll say why well, anyone could have said that and it's and it's true anyone could have done that we, we didn't but it it was there um and and that's why it's so hard to kind of prove the estes method though so what we do with we get someone in another room two people and we um they're asking questions and leaving a break and, the, and then the other person's writing down the question and what time it's said. And then in the other room, someone's got headphones on and um, um, if eye masks, so they can't see, they can only hear. So it's noise cancelling headphones. Yeah. And then there's a timestamp and they're, they're, they're speaking what the other person say, what, sorry, they're speaking what, what they're hearing. And then you can marry them up to see if um, it matches. Um, and, and, it's very rare it happens, but sometimes you get some intelligent responses to to that, to those questions that actually flow, not one off because one off could just be coincidence. But when they actually flow, um, that's always interesting. Mm, that, that's very intriguing. That mm. it's, it's very. It, I say it is very rare to find something that is convincing and 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 quite clear. Yeah, a lot of this is submerged in noise. Mm. Uh, a lot of the EV, EVP um, recordings are just so indistinct. Yeah, and it could just be a... You do hear about an actual voice which is as clear as day, quite yeah. rare. And then the accusation is that, well, is it radio interference on yeah. your recording? So you just don't know, do you? Yeah, we, we had one, and, it, and this conversation started coming through, and we looked outside and there was two um, motorcyclists, and one of them was an instructor. Yeah. And had had um, a microphone on to the person behind to instruct him. So we were getting this conversation for an argument, yeah. and it was it was just someone driving past. Yeah, baby monitors are another good thing for interference. They do pick up all kinds yeah. of stray radio emissions. So you, you've got you've got to be very careful in these in these matters. Yeah, yeah, and and that house as well. We um, we were asking asking him to move a move a ball on the floor, the one where we had the clear EVP. And um, and at the moment we didn't have the camera on it. That's when it moved. Oh, that always, happens, always 
yeah. always happens. It's almost as if they are having a game with you. They wait until you're not focused or the camera's not working or whatever, or yeah. it's just slightly out of camera shot. Then they'll do their little tricks. Yeah, always. yeah. And that's why I think they're like little children playing games with us. Yeah, oh, oh, and I also think it's... I, I think part of the point is it's just meant for you in that moment there. Yeah. Because you can't evidence it. So there's something about the the person that's there at the time that this like the activity is for. We always say like the most activity we ever get on a paranormal investigation, if we get any, is when we're setting up and when we're taking our equipment down. Absolutely, you know? yes. It's like you, you you're not your mind isn't focused, it's distracted by other yeah. things. Yeah. But the moment that you go into this um focused state of mind, that's like an, an inhibition to the ghost to stop doing their stuff. Yeah. And I don't know whether the ghosts do it deliberately or there is something in the brain which is which prevents things happening. It's yeah. like there's a trick within the brain that sends like, like a broadcast signal to the environment to right ghosts, go away. We don't want you. So other ghosts deliberately or or, or accidentally are adhering to what our brain is doing at the time. That happens all the time though. Mm. When you're yeah. least expecting it, things happen. And it's got to, there's got, to, in my opinion, there's got to be some kind of interaction between the brain and the environment. I don't know what it is. I, I did study this a few years back with the various um, electrical activity of the brain, like the alpha and the beta rhythm and so on. And I, I thought if we could perhaps flood the environment with an amplified version of the relaxed brain state uh, or a distracted brain state, Will it be a trigger for things to happen? And I, I thought, well, this requires someone with more knowledge of electronics than I've got. And I, I've talked to a few people about it, and they just said, "Oh, that's interesting." And shrugged their shoulders, walked away. Nothing came of it. Right. But that's what I'm thinking. There is something odd happening between the brain and the environment, mm. which triggers or suppresses this these phenomena. I, I can't think of any other reason for it. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Carl Carl Jung did a bit of research, didn't he? Because he he thought this the unconscious was controlling matter, so he he perceived yeah. it all coming from us. That's right. Yes, and also this... you've got the things like um, um, some experts done in quantum physics, which shows that the outcome of an experiment can be determined by whether you're observing it at the time or not. Like the, um, Schro the so called Schrodinger's cat thought experiment. But other things as well, like whether your brain is focused on what you're doing or whether you're not paying full attention to the experiment, that can affect the outcome in, in a quantum physics in a quantum physics sense, not yeah. in a macroscopic sense, in a microscopic sense. And I just think there is something happening in the brain. Yeah. There's so much about the brain that we just do not know about, and so much has been mapped and understood. That I think there's is amongst all this tangled mess of data about which we know nothing. Is there something in there like an on-off switch for ghosts? Yeah. I, I often get intrigued by that, and I, yeah. I just don't know the answer to it. And uh, I also do a, a lecture in ADHD, um, and this, there seems to be a lot of experience for people with ADHD as well, Yeah, where, where poltergeist activity just occurs ar around them. Um, and even the um, some parapsychologists put the traits of... of that people that have so much poltergeist activity around them normally have these specific traits and all of them were part of the diagnostic criteria yes. for ADHD as well, which is, which is really fascinating. Um, so that's kind of a different, a different kind of state of consciousness yeah. itself. Um, your books are about the different pubs and inns and all over the country. Well, I've actually got three books out, three ghost books. Have you? What, what the, what's the other one? Well, the first one is um, The Ghosts of Kings Lynn and West Norfolk. And that is a massive research effort. That took years to write, and that's in its second edition. Um, and that has a lot of ghost cases around here, a lot of which you will definitely not have heard of before. Um, so it's got Kings Lynn as the main focus because it's the biggest town in this area. But um, we've also got um, Sandringham, Fakenham, Thetford with the Bell Inn, of course. Um, got Sandringham. We've got a loads of little towns around here that you might not have heard of, which are really rife with spectral activity. Um, there's Dursingham in Goldisthorpe and Snettisham, and one of my favourites is in Heacham, which is to the northwest of uh, Norfolk, just to the south of Hunston. 
and I've actually interviewed a witness who lived in a haunted house and he lived there from 71 till 86 and he said during that time there was a plethora of mainly poltergeist stuff but also some phantom activity as well and he loaned me his uh, late mother's what's left of his late mother's notes and they're on my desk at the moment and when he moved out he sold the house to his sister uh and things were still happening until she moved out about 2010 or something like that so that's like uh, what's that 40 years of ghostly phenomena he seems to have tailed off towards the end though um and that was reported briefly in the newspapers in 1971 and then it just completely faded away it they acted as if uh, the ghosts had just been banished and the, there was a, there's a good reason for that they got in a local uh, medium a psychic medium uh, called michael sadgrove to uh, exercise the ghosts and danny this the witness who lived there as so a, a teenager he said that he was there about six or seven times and each time he went he managed to banish a ghost until there was one left that he just could not get rid of it refused to budge and michael sadgrove had to admit the defeat on this and the ghost was there for i think it's now quiet in the house but it was there for many many years afterwards mm -hmm. well the family received so much ridicule from neighbors and particularly the clergy who really gunned for the family in a big way mm -hmm. that they put out a cover story to the press saying we've had a psychic healer in um, he's purged the house of the ghost and now all is quiet and after that it just went completely silent in the press but danny said no it went on for years and years and years and they only issued this because they were so sick of the ridicule they're getting from mm -hmm. the town's folks um a lot of his family has now passed away not just due to old age but he blames the ghosts a lot of them he says have died due to problems with breathing like asphyxia or mm -hmm. hanging or in the case of his younger younger sister who died age three, she had an attack of acute laryngitis and she was okay one day and dead the next. And Danny said it was almost as if the ghost was feeding off death. Right. Um, yeah. And that story went on for a long time, and it's it's not it's now up for sale if you want to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the last owners they said it was a it was, it was a family home, and the last owners said, "Oh, all these they all just stories." I think, mm -hmm. well, you bloody well tell that to the people who lived there for decades yeah. and got put up with this. Yeah. Um, there was one rather amusing little um, anecdote towards, towards this. Um, Danny gave me a very, very long list of the ph phenomena that he and his family had encountered while they were living there. And it seemed to go a bit quiet when he moved out in 86. Uh, there were a few interesting little things, but not much. And I thought, well, why is that? And it soon became clear that the reason for it was a lot of the phenomena was auditory and the sister who bought the house was stone deaf. Right. <laughs> she couldn't hear a thing that was taking place around her. The, the one, one thing that did happen to her was she went into the cellar and she saw the ghost of a, a Quaker appear in front of her and it threw a gold coin at her. And when it hit, when it landed near her, it had turned into a lump of coal. And that was the only thing that Danny knew about apart from a few minor things that uh, Vivian had told her. But for the rest of the time, the ghost could have been playing a, a brass band in the house and she wouldn't have had a clue what was going on because she couldn't hear it. So I think the ghost was playing to an empty audience there. So it's probably screaming all day. Once, yeah. We had a laugh on the ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's a brilliant story. I'm, um, I think I've got a, a story for you, but off, off air um, from, from your neck of the woods that's, okay, that's I've great. just been told. So I'll... Uh, I'll tell you that afterwards. But yeah, I lived in a house and one of the reasons I really got into it so much was because um, we moved from down south to a place called Brompton by Sword and, and lived in this house that had been there since medieval times. And it was it was like out of a horror movie, the the activity, you know, you, almost the caricature of a horror film haunted house happening. But yeah. that has a has a history of suicide um, to it. So we got it, my parents got it cheap because the previous owners had committed suicide. We found out that the owners before that had committed, not all of them, the patriarch had committed suicide, sorry. 
Um, my brother took his own life. My dad left because he said he felt like he would have taken his own life. My mother attempted suicide numerous times oh, in that house. I'm sorry but, about that. Yeah, and and I always say if you, if I was homeless, even with my children, and I was offered this house for free, I would say no. Yeah. Um, it, it, there's just something about it that's really kind of dark. So I, I got into it almost to beat the the fear um, by, by trying to understand and research and yeah. and find out what it is. But but that house is, yeah, quite exceptional. Um, and we had we had people that would would mock us even when we talked about the activity come in um, and, and run <laughs> and never yeah. come there. One of my friends uh, used to wait at the end of the road when when he was picking me up. He wouldn't even drive near the house. Oh God! And he was—he was a hardcore skeptic. That is exactly like this house in Heatham I mentioned. When people come to view the house, the estate agent would stay in the car. He wouldn't go in. He just give the <laughs> give the uh, the viewees the keys and say, "Right, you go in and and do what you have to." The whole town knew the of the building's reputation, and a lot of people just wouldn't go inside, which was yeah. embarrassing for the house folk, even if you know. People were taking the piss out of them and laughing at them. They knew the place as a reputation, and some would not go inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it is an interesting one. It is an interesting one. Um, so your haunted hospitality books. Why do you think so many pubs are haunted? I think it's because they they exhibit a, a, a very very large tapestry of the quirks of human life. We spend a lot of time in pubs, so they see a lot of different activity, um, you know, from laughter through to heartbreak and sorrow, even murders. And that perhaps the fabric does pick up on that somehow. Um, but there has to be said that quite a few probably are hoaxes, the landlord yeah. trying to drum up um, trade, particularly in this most haunted era, where venues see uh, pound signs when they, well, they equate ghost hunters to... Um, <laughs> lucrative business deals so I, I think a lot of them probably are, oh are these lots or maybe some are due to um hoaxes to drum up trade mm. but i think a lot of ghost cases are just due to the fact that they've, they've been around for so long and they've seen so many people some of that must rub off mm. on the environment somehow yeah so that's my opinion so that's pubs and hotels another accommodation but also that you, that can apply to any kind of um um, establishment museums theaters mm. um stately homes anything like that they all see a lot of people mm. and particularly with like museums they used to be stately homes by them initially and they must have seen their own share of heartache and and joyousness so yeah. yes I, th I think that could be a, a reason and I suppose if you've got a house that's haunted, sometimes like, the only people that know about it are the, the residents. But if you've got a, a pub that was, especially if it was once an inn, these stories probably would have gone all over the country. That's right, yes. Um, it's hard to know what to make about some uh, pub ghost stories. Um, you get some really good descriptions of the phantoms or the poltergeist, but they are absolutely impervious to a further research. And that's like what I was saying about ghosts that float around and attach to people. Um, you can go back through the records as far as you can, but you can't find anything that um, correlates with what people are what correlates what people are seeing as ghosts. So you mm -hmm. might see an Elizabethan lady floating through the, the red line somewhere, and you go back and research the building, and you just can't find anything that matches it. And all you can do is just throw up your hands in despair, report the uh, report the case, and leave it at that. There's nothing yeah. more you can do with it. Yeah, yeah. Have Have you found any commonalities amongst a lot of the stories? Are there any kind of tropes that you see? Um, it doesn't matter what part of the country you're in, that there are kind of similarities of certain things that are haunting pubs. Yes. Um... The uh, the black shadows that I mentioned earlier on is a is probably the best example. Not many cases of recognizable human or animal forms, but a lot of black shapes, and usually out of the corner of the eye. Very very rarely seen head on. Um, that is one thing that did recur quite a lot. The most spectacular example was in Wales, and it, 
I'm, I'm probably going to completely mispronounce this, but I've, the Lindia Inn, L-L-I-N-D-I-R. Don't know how it's pronounced, but that's that's the name of it. Um, well, I phoned up the landlady and had a chat with her, and she told me a few things that had happened. And she said that one afternoon she was at the she was at the bar with two farmers and they were enjoying their drinks when all of a sudden this huge black shape came bursting through the front door, uh, and it rushed past them into the bar at the back, the room at the back. And they went and looked for it and it had gone. And this was right in full view, straight in front of everyone. And the farmer's reaction was, well, you should expect, what the <clears throat> was that? Yeah. And that was one of the few cases where uh, this black shape has been seen head on and not just out yeah. the corner of the eye. That's the most spectacular one that I found. But she is reporting that it is very, very quiet these days. And that's something else I've found during my ghost survey places that were very active not so long ago are now completely dormant or extinct of ghosts that's interesting they're reporting nothing at all for quite a few years now um and a lot of the famous places are also saying that as well they're saying mm. yes we did have ghosts so we had reports but nothing for a couple of years now that's um, interesting i'm not sure why that is um putting my scientist hat on i think that it might be a case of the ghost's energy is just running down like batteries. Mm. Even if you leave batteries on a shelf and do nothing with them, the energy is just going to fade away to nothing. And I think, are we actually seeing the end days of many of these famous ghost stories? Mm. Um, that is really interesting. Yeah. It's it certainly struck me. That, and that's, this has happened fairly recently within the last decade, and maybe in the last four or five years, but certainly in the last decade, uh, they're now saying nothing has nothing has been reported, right. or at least very very low key stuff. Like worse before, they might have had apparitions. Now they just get odd footsteps right. or the lights flickering. Nothing major. I but suppose I'm it, quite surprised to learn that. Yeah, that's it. Makes me quite sad in a way. Um, I think as, as a lot of people are, aren't going. Uh, you know, there maybe the the footfall has has decreased, and maybe that's what feeds the the energy. Yeah, it could be. Uh, another possibility is that if the ghosts require uh, an amenable mental attitude to uh, materialise, if you've got a sceptical landlord mm. and sceptical staff, then this goes back to what we are saying about the brain environment um, interaction. If you've got staff there who are not well disposed to believing in ghosts, is that stopping these things from appearing? Mm. But I have have spoken to believers um, agnostics and skeptics across all across the whole spectrum of um, ghost reports and they all report the same thing so it doesn't matter whether you're a skeptic or a believer they're all saying the same thing they're saying that there have been no reports of very little in the last few years and after you've heard this dozens and dozens and dozens of times you start to see the pattern there you start mm. to think right there this is definitely some kind of proper phenomenon this is not a statistical quirk this is really something that the and i was badly misquoted in the press um twice now for saying that ghosts are dying out what i was saying is they're becoming less common yeah uh and another thing to bear in mind is that when i was doing my ghost survey i made a, a huge list five thousand locations of ghost of ghostly locations and i focused on the ones that I could easily contact. And I always had in the back of my mind that how many of these ghost stories are genuine? They're not hoaxes, but how many of them have been created by word of mouth, by mm. Chinese whispers, or just by association? And that's just been picked up and repeated over the years. And there aren't any ghosts now there now because there were never any ghosts there in the first place. Yeah, uh, A good example is um, a reporter went into a a pub and asked about ghosts and at that exact same second the mirror fell off the wall and then the Chinese whispers started building up and then people started confabulating and adding to the basic legend um, so it's like a, a little quirk of coincidence there weren't ghosts there now and there certainly were none there in the past but they've been repeated so many times that people accept this so a lot of the stories might be that they're just uh, misidentifications or just legends 
Yeah. No basis in fact. So maybe yeah, maybe some of these ghost stories uh, where I've heard that there's been nothing for the last couple of years fall into that category. I just don't know. But it's certainly striking when you hear the same thing over and over again. Mm. And it's so frustrating when you hear a really promising uh, location. And one of my favourites is the uh, the Buster House Hotel, way up in the Shetlands. And it looks fantastic, particularly if you like um, if you would like to see the Aurora Borealis. It's right out in the middle of nowhere. And when I did my survey in I did it over two years, 2020 to 2022. And that's one of the first places I contacted. And it was the first one to come back and give me a really long list of ghostly things happening there. I thought, fantastic. Wrote it all down. And then when I wrote Haunted Hospitality version two, I did a mini survey and I recontacted many of these places. And that was one that's on my list. And I was very upset to learn that in the last four years, um, they've had very little happen. Right. So in that space of time, it's gone from exciting to just dead. Right. Yeah, that's um, fascinating. Uh, yeah, that, that, that was upsetting because I'd like to visit that place. Um, a couple of uh, a couple of other venues that didn't respond to my original survey did this time round with fascinating tales. Um, some said, "Yeah, it was quiet then. It's quiet now." Um, only a very few places did um, report an increase in activity. But when I say increase, it's all relative because what they're reporting now are again shadows and footsteps and whatever, something that is so low key that it could be misinterpreted or ignored as anything else the first time around. So it might be that there was very low key ghosts there in my first survey and they're still there now. I don't think the ghosts are starting to come back. Mm. It's just a case that people might uh, ask. Uh, people might be seeing these things now and misinterpreting them for whatever reason, whereas they weren't in the past. Mm. But there's, 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 there's been no cases where it's gone from zero to 60. In right. Two seconds. It, there's been no case of nothing there, and now it's apparitions galore, nothing yeah. like that, which confirmed my, uh, my theory that the ghost cases are dwindling, they're dying out, or they're dying down. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, that's. Um, I'm going to have to ruminate on that as to why that might be. That's oh, really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, we, I live in Scarborough, and, and we, we this. Oh quite yeah, a lot. I know it well. Yeah, I'm from the northeast myself. Ah right, yeah, and and you were at York as well, weren't you? That's so, right. Yes. And from, um, yeah, I spent a lot of my time in Darlington, so we visited Scarborough every year to visit the your grandparents. Right. Yeah, it's it's a lovely place, but there, there's there's so much. Um, there's loads of haunted pubs. Um, and lots of stories and they're never keen to get us in because they're scared to lamp up and I, I always say it's never bad for a pub financially to have a ghost story attached to it but yeah they're um it's still be i think part of the the fishing community is still quite superstitious yeah um so it's quite difficult to get in some of these places yeah um, it, it's funny because pubs usually are quite happy to let ghosts mm. in but hotels aren't they're, they're yeah. the category who responded least favorably to my survey. Um, by that, I mean they either didn't reply at all or they said, no, nothing here. Yeah. And I think with um, with haunted pubs, it's like um, going there for a bit of a lark. You go there on a night out and you know you sit over your pint of lager and pork scratch and, and hope to see the, the phantom uh, laughing cavalier with his head tucked in his arm. But if you were stop overnight in a haunted hotel, I don't think anyone wants to wake up at three o'clock in the morning and finding a phantom monk um, hunched over them. That would just scare the crap out of anyone, really. So yeah. I think they're least they're least willing to publicise their ghosts mm. or admit that they do have a problem. Yeah, um, some places do because the owners are either interested or they just don't care. Yeah, they just uh, think, well, it, I can't help to talk about it. And I've had so many people say that they don't believe in ghosts, but we've had things here happen here that we just cannot explain. Uh, there's a great one in Chepstow. Um, he and his wife were doing the laundry one day and they went out in the corridor to collect some items and stuff that had been folded on the bed when that was now scattered on the floor. And there was no one else in the building at the time. And the ghosts seemed to focus on the male clientele rather than the ladies. Mm -hmm. And they had two men stopping there one night um, in the guest room and the next morning one of them woke up to find out that their 
um, bedside table had been turned completely 180 degrees around so it now faced the wall and they hadn't heard a thing during the night and little things like that Little things like I say, the landlord said he didn't believe in ghosts, but we've had stuff here that he just cannot explain. Yeah, yeah. But, and I, this I, is I the hotel. You thought they wouldn't admit to that because no one wants to stop there. And I think, well, I know thousands of people across the country who would spend good money to spend a night in a haunted house. Yeah, tell them yeah. about it. They'd love it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'm one of those uh, strange yeah, people. Yeah, me too. My wife doesn't <laughs> know. She um, she gets a bit scared of these things, shall we say? Yeah, yeah. My my girlfriend's had the bit of the hitchhiker effect, so my my house and I've always had some sort of poltergeist activity. Apart from I think two places I've lived, yeah. um, and I don't know why. But then my girlfriend started having activity at her house, and oh. um, last night she she's almost for me annoyingly obsessed with making sure that not only is the door locked, but the the latch is on as well. Her, her dad was a policeman, um, so she's hyper vigilant, and um, she said she could hear like the traffic really loud and it's, it, this is strange and she looked and the front door was unlocked and open oh so she locked it and put the the bolt on the um chain um and it happened again so oh my god yeah so we're, i'm gonna go in uh this afternoon and have a look at that what, what might be happening there's some other things as well so um hearing noises <coughs> her daughter was upstairs and um in the room above and i was like it's, it's midnight she's very uh active and we just put it down so she's just shoveling about in her sleep um because we hear the bed right above like really yeah. making a lot of noise but then the next night her daughter wasn't there and it was still still doing it so oh. <laughs> um and th things being thrown and stuff like that so yeah it's uh it's gonna try and do some communication this afternoon and see if we can maybe shift right, it well, but keep me informed please i will i will <laughs> The other thing I, I, I was amazed to find, um, because as I said to you, I go, I go about telling ghost stories on, on TikTok and I'm always researching. And if I go to any new place that I'm always looking for, for stories and I even look on the um, like TripAdvisor saying, oh, I stayed here and this happened, yes. um, which can be when, when you found a few. But you've got an app that, that's got a map of the country um, and you put in your postcode and it brings up loads of stories from all around, which is absolutely amazing. So tell oh, us about how, how, how did that come about? How did you start that? Well, I just thought years ago that someone really should sit down and uh, create a haunted map of the UK, little thinking that that would be me. And a lot of the information that I got was is i admit a lot of it's from uh, books or magazines yeah but also some uh, information like facebook forums groups um word of mouth my friends contacted me or my own experiences i think there's about five thousand of them at the moment and um, i'm currently having a few technical problems with the app at the moment due to uh google but i think they'll be fixed in the near future um, so that that's sort of in abeyance at the moment. I've got a, lots of other projects, and I've had my second book um, to worry about. So I've, I've put the app very much on the back burner at the moment. Um, but another thing I wanted to do was I wanted to see if there's any kind of geographical um, distribution, any kind of recognisable pattern to the ghost reports. And after mapping all these, I came to the conclusion that it's, it just seems to be completely random. But what I would like to do, and this would take a lot of work, so this is something for the long term, um, so it's a long term project, is to focus on those cases where they have had ghost reports in the near few in the, in the, in the near past, and see if there's any kind of distribution to them, because if something has faded away or died completely, mm. then just write them off as historical curiosities and, and just leave them. There's nothing you can do about them now. They're, the ghosts are probably gone on holiday without us can't see i blame them very much <laughs> so focus on the ones which do seem to be active and see if there's any kind of pattern to those now it looks to me like there isn't a pattern it's all completely random but there was a fascinating documentary a few years back which used a few data points that said that ghosts might follow fault lines mm. and there are many major fault lines in the uk uh, nothing on the scale of something like the San Andreas Fault, but just big enough to cause minor earth tremors. And they're also minor fault lines. So you've got all these fault lines crisscrossing the country. I don't think it, it would be 
fascinating to see if there is a distribution um, mm. map matching between the fault lines and the ghost reports. I say that would be a long term job. It'd be a massive undertaking because I need to get the geographical data for the fault lines. But that's something that has always intrigued me. Mm. But as far as I can see at the moment, they're all just randomly spread across the country with no pattern at all. Right. Okay. Which is, which is a bit of a shame, really, because if we knew where they were going to appear, then we could lay in wait for them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but ghosts never play ball, do they? They always like to keep us on our toes. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. It's almost on purpose, I think. Yes. Um, you've given so much of your time, Paul. So um, I'm, I'm going to put the app and the links to your books in the show notes so people can go and look and uh, in there. Do, do you have a website or something or a place where people, if they've got any um, experiences or they've got a story in a, a pub yeah. or anything, that they can contact you? Yeah, I, I can email them to you, yes. Excellent. Um, it, it's just like uh, www.pauly.com slash ghost but i can send all this to you later on as well as some pictures like um i've got some photographs of um the hospital and um the headline news of the hot of the of the heacham house and the squash court at bertram newton so if, you, if you're doing like a, a slideshow in for this podcast you can just um, flash them up occasionally if you want so I've got a few things, and also uh, pictures of my uh, the front covers of my book, if that might help. Uh, I've got one right here. right here. It's going to be yeah, good. that's yes, yeah. You bought it, Wait, yeah, yeah, you. yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. Well, the the uh, the second one is um is the same design but in red, and that came. <laughs> God, that cover caused no end of trouble because what I wanted to do was I wanted to create a cover that was completely different from the first. So I got my wife to take a picture of me in bed with the covers huddled around me so that only my nose and my eyes were peering above. And I had this look of absolute terror on my face. And we took a picture and I stuck it on the cover and I thought, well, it's exactly how I wanted it to be, but it looks worse. Right. I thought, God, so what am I going to do for a front cover? And I spend more time agonising over the covered artwork than I do about anything else in the book. So in the end, I thought, well, since it's part of a series, why don't you just take the front cover from the first book and change the blue for red? And then if you do really a third well. book, you do green. So yeah. I thought, that's going to take hours to do. So I was fiddling about with GIMP on the colour settings. And by chance, I found um, a colour wheel. And I pressed red, moved a slide along, and clicked on blue. And bingo, it did it in two seconds. Fantastic. But the original cover artwork was, it was awful. It would look like me just being terrified of something in bed. <laughs> Complete crap, to be honest. It's, it, I love the cover and the red works really well. And I like the the series. It's, it does stand out. It's, um, yeah, because of what I do, but as soon as it came out, I, I start getting emails going, have you seen this book, James? It's right up your street. Oh, so, great. I'm glad you like it. Yeah, it's the fantastic. Second volume, the second volume is exactly the same, but it turned out to be a lot bigger than I was expecting. I thought it would be um, about 320 pages, 600 hotels, and it turned out to be about 800 hotels wow. and 476 pages. And the reason why it expanded so much was mainly because of Scotland. If you look in the, um, the first volume, there were so few haunted pubs in Scotland that I just put them on one map. Right. And now there are so many haunted hotels in Scotland because a lot of them used to be castles. Yeah. That I've had to do separate maps for each uh, uh, county or region in the Scottish Isles. And that took a long time to do. So if you look at this, there's now more maps, and it's mainly because of Scotland. Right. Than the first one. Wales has only got uh, one map to the whole of the country. And I only have, to my great shame, I could only find two haunted hotels in Northern Ireland. Right. Um, one of which is the famous Ballygally Castle, which sounds amazing. But they tell me that they've had nothing happen recently. Right. Which is a great shame. Um, so any listeners in Northern Ireland need to get in touch? I, I really do. I would have hoped to have fleshed that out a bit more. I just get a little bit wary about people who buy the book expecting a huge category of ghost sightings 
Um, the book is a gazetteer, let's face it. Um, it's it got a brief summary of ghost reports, unless I found out a lot by personal interaction with these places. And it, if you come from the East Riding of Yorkshire or Merseyside, you're going to be disappointed with this book. But on the other hand, if you live in Kent, you're going to love it because that's got 44 um, haunted hotels. So you'll, as they say, your mileage may vary. Yeah. Um, some places are next to nothing and some have got a real glut of ghost cases. And as a lot of the reports are just a few lines uh, with a bit of historical background, a summary of the ghost reports, but a few places, um, the hotels just wouldn't shut up about their ghosts. Right. Or I've been in contact with researchers who have given me a load of fantastic information and that can go on for pages. So on the other hand, it's a bit disproportionate. A few places report very little or they wouldn't reply and all I've got are just a few lines. I did my best. I put my hands up. I got. I did my best to get more information out of them. On the other hand, you turn the page and you found somewhere like um, the Buster House Hotel or the Jamaica Inn or the Mermaid Inn, and it just goes on and on and on because they were very, very happy to talk about their ghosts or researchers were happy to talk about them. So I say your mileage may vary. I'll I've definitely be able to help you out with the North East. I'll, I'll, I'll get you I've, some I've uh, stories. That, yes. I've got very little in the North East, actually, and a lot of it came from um, Darren Ritson's fantastic books, he produced one about haunted pubs and taverns in the northeast, and um, he's a friend of mine. And again, I contacted them all, and very few replied. Right. Um, surprisingly, a few in Yorkshire, um, and uh, not much response from those either. Um, but very also, superstitious. I, I did my there. best. Did this time round, out of eight hundred hotels, I managed to find email addresses for about 600 of them. And I emailed every single one of them and I got some good responses back, but mostly it was nothing at all or just nothing. It's all quiet now. Right. Um, and a few places that didn't respond first time around now did give information. Um, there's one in Bath, I think. Uh, I forget the name of it, where, they're not, uh, where they gave me a, their recent phenomena. But sadly, uh, a few places that gave great information uh, two to four years ago now wouldn't reply or didn't reply. Right. Uh, and now, and one of the ones that sticks out is the Crown Hotel in um, Wells in Somerset. The the guy, the landlord, had collated an information pack and he emailed it to me. And a lot there was a lot of it, including his own recent personal experiences, that wasn't in the papers. And I thought this time around he might have a bit more information. He didn't respond. Right. That's a shame. So it, it all depends on location to location. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose that some some of the you know, pub landlords will move on and new people will come in and and it's a bit like you some people are just closed and don't experience it, like you said. Yeah, or they, they just assign it to mundane things like the, the sound of footsteps could be timbers creaking in the night, mm. that kind of stuff. It, it doesn't even occur to them there might be a ghostly problem. And a few places didn't even know they had ghosts until I told them. Right. <laughs> and that opens up a huge can of worms because this goes back to what we were saying a brief while ago. If they do believe in ghosts and you tell them and they didn't know, are you instilling the fear of God into them? How are they going to react? Yeah. yeah. And most time it's just with levity. It's like, oh, it's like, oh, thanks for telling me. I didn't know. Sorry, no ghosts here, but thanks. It's interesting. Not one of them replied, OMG, exclamation mark, exclamation yeah. Because they think, God, what what the hell have I done? Yeah. Have I, have I really frightened these people so much. What are they are they going to call in an exorcist now? What have <laughs> I done? That hasn't happened. No, good. Maybe, maybe some will have some activity start though, because they they then are open to it. Who knows? It might be, or they might start interpreting um little things as ghostly. So it works either way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, might, well, who knows that? Um, oh God, I was just trying to think. There's there's another one in Norfolk where the guy didn't know about the ghosts there. He'd heard he'd heard rumors of um in the past when before he was there of a vacuum cleaner turning itself on. But he just put that down to nothing. 
Mm. And he said, you know, it's funny to say that. We do hear noises at night and we put it down to the boiler playing up. But he didn't think it was footsteps that had been reported in the past. Right. It didn't frighten him. He was interested. Yeah. So he right. knew that there might be something there, but he put yeah. it up his butt. But now he was having second thoughts. Right. Yeah. It's, it puts a new frame on on what what you've heard, I guess. Yeah, he does. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. It's fantastic, Paul. Thank you so much for giving so much of your time. Um My pleasure. And anyone that's interested, uh, the books are available on Amazon. All the links will be in the show notes. Um, and if you have stories that aren't featured, Paul would really like to hear them. So if you own any pubs, um, hotels, do get in touch. Absolutely. I'd really love that because there's just something exciting about hearing about a brand new location. Or even if you're stopping somewhere. Um, I, I'm naturally a very, very timid person. I find it hard to interact with people at times. I get very nervous. But there's been a few times when I've worked up the courage to go to the front desk and asked if they have ghosts. And bingo, it's worked. They've actually told me about their phantoms. Um, and w one of those places was somewhere that hadn't been reported anywhere before. That was in Boston, the, the White Heart, I think it was. And they said, it's, it's quiet now, but in the past, the, the old stables, which are now part of the bar, has they've heard and seen ghostly horses in there. And the um, the cleaning staff have seen a white figure on the second floor landing, and this has not been reported anywhere else. Right. Um, but it's a double-edged sword. I've had at least two... No, I've had two landlords who knew I was coming in for a little chat about their ghost, and they hid. They, right. they hid upstairs. And they, they apologised on both occasions, and it was feasible for me to go back and interview them again. But... They talked about their ghosts, but when it came to the crunch, they bottled it. They, yeah, they actually hid in the building. They wouldn't talk to me. Yeah, we we get that with it. We've we've been invited in, and we often will either turn up and say oh, we we haven't to cancel because of this, or um, they'll cancel kind of like just as we're setting off and things like that. Yeah. It's almost like they don't want to talk about it, or you know, invite anything to to occur. Yes, um, that's exactly it. I went. I went to one in in Liverpool, and um, they said, "Well, we're just busy, and we're we're closing soon. But if you come back tomorrow, we'll talk to you." And then I went back the next day, and they said, "Well, we're just really busy, and we're closing soon. But if you come back tomorrow, to, we'll talk." And I was like, "I'm leaving now." So <laughs> yeah, that was a shame because that was a really interesting. Well, one, the one but... famous hotel in um, Down and Market that featured and helped my house is haunted, and he really, really annoyed a group of me and my ghost hunters because we'd arranged a time to meet up with him and we got there a little bit earlier than planned and the place was closed on sunday afternoon and evening so we had the whole place to ourselves we waited outside his hotel for three hours and he he wasn't in there was no, no one in the building at all and he'd arranged specifically for that time to for us to turn up and do our ghost research and he just disappeared mm. and, um, then he, he then he himself just disappeared. Uh, All right. He completely vanished. The, one day, the hotel was boarded up, and he'd vanished. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't say the rumors that I've heard, but it's safe to say that he left a lot of people, particularly the brewery, very very upset mm. that he left them in the lurch. I don't right. think it's to do with ghosts. I think it's more to do with the money problems. Yeah. I don't think sure, but yeah, he went place the brewery moved in he'd gone they boarded the place up and after a few months they got a new landlord in and i'm trying to get access to it but i think it's now quiet and that's yeah. the accusation that it was all a big hoax right There's justification that uh it was a complete the ghost reports were complete fraud to drum up public uh bring up trade and publicity right so that yeah. was a waste of time and that was one where the landlord Knew I was in. He'd been told. The bar staff told him. He came down. He talked to other punters. He knew I was there. And he disappeared back up again. He did that a few times. And he had no intention of speaking to me. It's bizarre, isn't it? Strange it's, behavior. It's, an, it's annoying. It, yeah, it it's is. Bloody annoying. Um, 
you just feel like your time's been wasted. I mean, Downermark is a nice little town to visit anyway, but I just I specifically went there just just to talk to this guy. Mm. And when he didn't turn up, I thought, kill two with one stone, write it off, you know, of a few of the places in town, get some pictures. And I thought, oh God, there's another pub just down the road that's supposed to be another hotel that's haunted. So I went in there, had a pint of very expensive beer. This is normally these days. And when the uh, barman was free, I went up to him and had a chat. And I explained who I was and what I was doing. And he said, apart from just the the creaking sounds you expect from a very old building, um, they've had nothing. So I thought, OK, the day hasn't been a complete write-off. Um, I've got something, even if it wasn't what I wanted. Yeah. It is frustrating. We, you know, sometimes we've had like some of our, we've only got a small team and often it's just, just me and one other person, but we might take a night off work of paid work, you know, to come and, yes. come and investigate. And then when they cancel, it's frustrating. And the other thing we get is sometimes the, the landlords are really keen for us to go in, but the brewery itself didn't, don't, doesn't want us. So we get that yeah. stumbling block as well. Sometimes. I've had that a few times. I've had a few cases where the staff are very, very keen to talk. Mm. but they need permission and mm. it just wasn't forthcoming yeah and yeah. at that point you, you you literally shrug your shoulders and say it's the one that got away yeah. there's nothing more you can do about it if you hassle them for more information you'll give yourself a bad name yeah and that means that other other hotels or pubs in the chain that might want to talk to you they're going to hear of your exploits and they're going to be told not to contact you. So you all you can do is just shrug your shoulders and accept it and move on. Yeah. And that is frustrating because there's so many great cases out there where you want uh, you either want access or you want more data. And when that isn't forthcoming, you have to give it all up. Mm. Some fantastic venues out there, and they give you little hints, but nothing more. They all they all they say in reply to an email is oh yes we've had customers and employees experience things and you you fish a bit more politely for information and it doesn't come and you think well how far do i press this without starting to sound like a creepy stalker yeah i might send a polite follow-up four weeks later but if that if nothing comes back from that you have to give it up and yeah. that's why in both my haunted hospitality books i make mention of the fact that the venues sometimes talk about ghostly um, reports with very little detail. And I sometimes say, unfortunately, I could not find any more information. And I literally mean that. Mm. I do my best without yeah. sounding like a pest. Yeah. It's, it's, well, it's an amazing, you know, it's a lot of work and it's a, it's a brilliant book. And I'm going to look forward to getting the second one as well. So um, well, thank you wanted, for doing it. One thing I wanted to encourage people to do, uh, particularly with the pubs one, was um, you might be driving around the countryside and you might want a, a pie and a pint or something. So you reach into your glove compartment, <laughs> the old school days of car driving, and you bring out this book and you say, oh, this, the, the red line's just down the road. It's about five minutes from me. And you go in, you have your drink, and maybe talk to the landlord and find out something for yourself. So with these books, I'm, I'm trying, and also with the app, I'm trying to encourage people to go out and learn a bit more about the pubs, the hotels and whatever. Um, but also because something you find might add to our knowledge of these places. Yeah. Um, who knows what you might experience. And also you might learn a bit of history. It might be informative. You might find some other locations that no one else knows about. Um, and also I wrote that at, a, at, a, at about the time when we were just recovering from the COVID pan pandemic when a lot of places were desperate for custom. And I thought, well, if by mentioning this in the book, it encourages people to go mm. to far-flung locations that really need the income, where's the harm in that? Yeah. yeah. If you go to, say, the Lindy Inn in Wales and they need the money, I'm not saying they do, but if they, if they need the money, go along there and support them. If you're into ghosts, why yeah. not? Why not support these industries? They need it, so yeah. why not do it? No, it's, it's a it's a brilliant piece of work, and uh, I recommend it to everyone. Thank you, I'm really gratified. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. My pleasure. I'm really, any time. I'm here for some. If you ever you want me to, definitely. Yeah.
I really liked it. Thank you, Paul. Cheers. Thanks a lot.